Hello everyone, welcome to day five of Sample Rooms Launching Week. So my name is Chloe, I'm from APLF Hong Kong team, and I'm the host for today's webinar. So welcome everyone again, whether you're watching from home or from the office, we've all adopted a new working and living lifestyle. So this is the time to connect, share and exchange knowledge. So if you have any questions at the bottom, there's a bar, there's a Q&A box, you can just type it in there and we'll try our best to answer it. So for those of you who are new here, welcome to Sample Room. It's the one and only social networking and sourcing platform for the B2B industry in leather and fashion. So do take your time to check it out and play around the functions and see what's out there for you. Our second initiative is APLF Academy. The Academy is launched to provide training programs and hands-on knowledge like this one here, today the webinar, on the industry to raise sustainability awareness. So in the following, you know, actually the final day actually, we have invited uh, speakers today to share their viewpoints on a lot of different topics. Today, we have invited Mike Redwood. He's a spokesperson for Leather Naturally. So Mike is a seasoned professional within the leather industry. He has held many senior positions in the leather and leather using industries, including footwear, sports, and gloves. Hi, Mike. So Mike regularly writes columns and blogs for industry, just like APLF. Being the spokesperson for Leather Naturally, he's also passionate to educate designers and consumers about leather. So he's also part of the APLF Sustainability Steering Committee to provide strategic direction towards sustainable leather. That being said, please welcome Mike. Good morning, everybody. Very nice to be here. Good morning, Chloe. Hello, Chloe. Uh, must be afternoon with you and all times for everybody watching, uh, uh, watching this. Um, I'd like to just start after I've shared my screen with you to talk about um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It's been uh, quite a, an astonishing year, and um, this is a big topic for um, this uh, digital week, and I'm particularly pleased to be representing um, Leather Naturally, which I've been involved in for over 10 years. And although I'm not so active in the day to day as I'm largely um, um, retired and there's a new young team taking this really important activity to uh, new um, levels, um, I'm delighted that uh, they still let me speak on their behalf from uh, uh, time to time. And I'm also delighted to be part of the APLF Academy which I think is an outstanding and important uh, concept at a time when corporate social responsibility, economic and social and government uh, uh, aspects of business, and this whole rather badly defined area of sustainability has become so important for um, all of us. Um, the last year from a COVID point of view has been uh, really uh, quite astonishing. Um, uh, I think as a quick summary, almost everybody uh, uh, watching this today or catching up on uh, YouTube will recognize the quick points that the world came very rapidly uh, just over 12 months ago to a rolling stop over a number of months uh, that very quickly uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, summer 2020 season was cancelled uh, and a lot of orders uh, because of the shock of it all were suddenly cancelled and quite a large number were not paid for. And there's still some issues today, a year on, uh, that some major brands uh, have still not paid for goods they'd ordered uh, raw material that had been purchased uh, uh, and production that had been done on their behalf. And as a consequence, many historic long-standing partnerships have been damaged irretrievably. Most tanneries and associated leather business uh, were talking by the half year of about a annual sales hit of about around about 40%. Um, millions of people have been made unemployed and had slipped back into uh, poverty. Uh, it had become clear, although in the first day it had been, 
had been said that this was a disease that would impact everybody at all levels in society, it soon became clear that the weaker segments, the poorer, the less well, uh, uh, and uh, some of the elderly were going to suffer most, and, and that has happened. Uh, governments around the world started borrowing huge sums to try and keep the economy going and to protect some of the workforce. And as we ended the uh, six months, um, uh, and as some countries had still not seen a huge impact or were uh, tending to deny that it was going to uh, uh, affect them, uh, others particularly in Asia, began a rolling restart, um, quite a dramatic start to 2020. And there was a considerable recovery around the world in the second half, and, and quite a considerable view that perhaps um, we were bringing uh, this disease uh, to an end. Um, by the end of the year, most companies in the leather business were saying that their annual losses compared to the year before, which to be fair had not been great, were between uh, 20 and maybe up to 30% down. Everybody in the world was in fact impacted in some way or another. And one of the most distinct features that we will all know about is that there was a transfer to the internet to digital very, very quickly. It wasn't just a matter of retail, it was every segment of our lives. And it was as though five years of uh, 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 development had been rushed um, into just a few months or one, one year. Uh, international travel and with it uh, tourism came largely to a stop. And the recovery of that tra travel is one of the least certain aspects uh, looking uh, forward. Um, whether there'll be uh, uh, limited um, tourism um, travel in the summer of this year, 2021, um, looks maybe a little hopeful, but much less uh, certain than one would have imagined a few um, a few months ago, and um, business travel, I saw that Virgin Airlines stated the other day, they did not expect business travel to ever recover to the same level that it um, had been. Um, right now, as we speak, uh, some parts of Europe, some states in the US, um, uh, large parts of Latin America, and in particular, India, are seeing uh, new waves uh, of, the, of the virus with new variants. And so the end is clearly not in sight yet. Um, what has become clear is that uh, uh, companies needed a fairly strong balance sheet to survive, um, but that as we look forward into 2021 and 2022, certain of the stronger economies, particularly those that were able to afford and get into the vaccination program quickly, and those that had stronger financial and, uh, 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 and fiscal economies uh, uh, look like uh, they're going to be able to create uh, very strong GDP growth as we go through the rest of this year and into 2022. That includes China and the US, um, probably the UK and the EU, if it can get through its uh, current uh, uh, wave. But with vaccinations beginning to roll out in Europe, that is probably going to happen. It does leave us with concerns about the huge number of emerging financially weaker countries that uh, don't have um, vaccination uh, uh, programs in place. And with everything that is happening, it looks like vaccinations for them might well be delayed. So that led to a new word 
uh, coming out during uh, the year of 2020 that we heard more and more, uh, and that was resilience. Resilience meant having a much stronger balance sheet than perhaps we'd held in the past, um, much more carefully considered supply chains. Supply chains have so far uh, changed less perhaps than we had expected, but the ongoing consideration of them as we um, work out how the world is changing it, it is very strong at the uh, moment. Um, there is going to be a renewed, very careful choice of future markets and customers as we watch the world rebalance. Uh, there's a huge need for improved marketing and associated um, innovation. It has come very clear that our everyday workforce is uh, exceptionally important and so that a flexible, fully involved workforce in which every individual matters is important. And we've seen some of the improvements that have come with home working has been about higher levels of trust and communication that we've seen in the past. past. And we've certainly seen society's dependence on huge numbers of um, lower paid uh, workers and uh, the importance of our workforce being willing to return to work um, in factories and keep our tanneries uh, and factories um, uh, going. This all means that we have to accept that some efficiency gain um, has involved too much risk and may have to be uh, pushed back slightly. That does not mean, of course, that manufacturing things better, uh, modernizing as the leather industry has been doing in the past uh, and making things as well as we can um, uh, should change. But it does um, require some adaptation and reconsideration about how ruthlessly we should be going through single suppliers, um, minimum stocks, and areas of that sort. And it's also very clear that a resilient and strong industry has got to start supporting its industry organizations better, and it cannot leave everything to others. As we look at renewal and how the industry and the world will look as this uh, uh, pandemic declines, uh, the first is that that decline is going to be slow. This is a disease that's going to linger and that pandemics of various sorts are here for other, forever. The global response is required to these big issues has become very, very apparent. And that's a problem because it comes at the same time as geopolitics appears to have come, become much less stable. Um, it was already happening before the pandemic, but the pandemic, some of the comments made, some of the developments and changes have only made matters worse. Um, the pandemic has affected the way we work, the way we live, work-life balance, all aspects of travel, uh, uh, of education. There's hardly a sector in our lives that have not had to adapt and evolve as a consequence of the pandemic. And when we think that the impacts for leather consumption arise as these changes flow through society, the needs, expectations, and hopes all change. Um, then we begin to see that our lives as tanners are also going to change to some degree. Uh, consumers will start to change their behavior, will start to change their attitudes toward product, and therefore to how they expect leather and items of leather to evolve. 
every, every sector will be affected. And we have some big new issues that are also global, like pandemics uh, coming up. We've obviously got, after this pandemic, uh, the world's economic situation. But on top of that, we're hearing a great deal about climate change, biodiversity, um, poverty and inequality, um, uh, diversity, uh, and with all the whole working and everything uh, going on with the digitization of society, there will start to be much, much greater internet crime even than we have been seeing. And small businesses, medium-sized businesses are definitely uh, now vulnerable. So all of these big new issues have a, an impact on leather. We can't sit back and say that we live in our private bubble. Um, what is happening in the world is part and parcel of the context in which we live our daily lives within our industry and will impact on how we make our products, where we make our products, and what products we actually make. And we've also seen that although we're used to raw material prices going uh, up and down, that uh, with the uh, significant uh, uh, growth in alternate materials, raw material price volatility that we have been seeing in the last two or three months um, has started to become a very big threat to our industry. And we badly need some stability and common sense coming into raw material prices. When we look at how our consumers uh, are going to change and the demand for leather is going to change, um, you need to focus a little bit on why people buy products and what impacts people. Um, and we have to recognize that individual identities change and are reconstructed in accordance with people's perceptions and their own status, context and circumstances. Um, we need to recognize that not only are people very complicated, but that purchasing has become more than just about uh, what we need. Uh, that material objects are used beyond uh, their pure functionality, which of course is hugely important in the versatility of leather, um, but uh, it's the other aspects, the conveying of elements of identity and expressing of social values that remain incredibly important now in purchases. And leather has to adapt um, and representations of, of leather uh, uh, re um, reflect the shifting nature of personal identity. Um, and they also reflect the fact, as you look back over the last thousand years or so, the, the capacity of leather as such a unique material to keep redefining itself. Quite a complicated series of um, concepts um, to understand, but it comes down to what a colleague of mine at the University of Bath wrote in a, a book uh, a few years ago, that we buy products uh, now in large part, not so much because we need them, but because we like them. Um, and that, that involves uh, wanting products that say something about who we are. Um, and of course, as you see in the pictures of, at the bottom, this can have outcomes that vary from country to country, which is important now because um, our consumers are moving um, uh, from the West to the East. And it's important to recognize that some of these concepts will translate in a slightly different way, in particular, for example, between collectivist and individualistic societies. Uh, where we've seen the difference 
in the way that different countries have been willing to accept and adopt the pandemic um, uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, and this is all part and parcel of why we like products. And the versatility of leather, uh, just look at these next two or three pictures. Um, uh, 1400 years ago in the north of England, we had two or three institutions producing huge books like these. This particular one took 1,200 pages or so, and I'm told that meant over 1,000 sheepskins were used in that one book. And we know of that particular book, they made three of them. We only have this one left, but we know that three were produced and they were making many, many more uh, like it. In some parts of the world, uh, sheep were hugely important for the production of books uh, such as uh, these. Go forward nearly a thousand years, also in the, in the, in the UK, this is from the Museum of Leathercraft in uh, Northampton, and this coat was made of European buffalo, so it's really thick, um, and was used uh, in the Civil War because the buffalo hide was so thick um, that it did prevent um, arrows and uh, some spears and things um, um, from uh, fully penetrating. If they were in very close battle and the velocity of the spear or the arrow was faster, they mixed uh, a slightly smaller coat with metal armor. But for officers that stood uh, a little distance from the, the battle um, to observe and control the strategy, a uh, buffalo coat like this was uh, um, um, adequate. And from really the beginning of trade back in the uh, Euphrates 3000 years ago, right up to modern day Tibet, hides and skins have been used for coracles uh, for boats like, uh, like this. But it's only as in Tibet today, in exceptional circumstances, that you'll ever see uh, any of these uh, uh, three in use. They're very niche uh, and unusual products. The world of leather has moved on. Leather is a very contemporary uh, material. We're very proud of all this history, but we're not bound by it. But we do observe it because updating old ideas is very much part of the contemporary um, world. But what it does show is that um, leather, being such a versatile and ubiquitous material, uh, has different meanings in different contexts. Um, it aids the construction of identities via consumer choice. And it's not that difficult for it to be different things to different people. And this is all about us not buying for needs alone uh, or for functionality alone. It is about having a material that allows uh, a reach beyond uh, all that into the symbolic, as you can see from the areas in the picture, the low. And I should just say, if you're finding all of these slides quite hard to keep up with, uh, you can email and I'll send you a PDF, or of course, this presentation will be on the APLF website or YouTube um, uh, for you to look at um, uh, after and take screenshots and read at your, um, at your leisure. Um, when you look at the different ways in which um, uh, people buy and use leather, you can see here from sports to luxury vehicles, to handbags, to uh, motorbike um, uh, um, uh, uh, clothing and, and jackets, um, uh, leather has an enormity of uses. And in each one, there's quite high levels of symbolism. 
this is a, a lot more than just utility and functionality. Getting that right um, um, so that the material of leather really works leather uh, uh, correctly, really works well, is important. But the value of leather in all these uses is a lot more than the functionality. So a few years ago, um, Anka Roberts um, at the University of Northampton um, um, studied this using what was a Q methodology in which she was an expert. And she identified quite a large number of, of groupings into which you could put the way people saw leather. And if you look at the bold text here and go into the detail perhaps uh, later when you have more time, you can see some of them are quite opposing. S uh, uh, sophistication and authentic authenticity against tough guy or, or quality and taste against rebels, uh, luxurious, and glamorous, innovative uh, 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 and feel good. This is a huge range. And of course, a material for, for all serious seasons, a material that pushes the boundaries. Um, and yet for others, it is this epitome of quality and, and, and taste, a, a sort of traditionality um, in the material. So it really moves from one end of the spectrum to the other in how we make it, uh, what articles are made from it, and how consumers relate to and use those, those uh, uh, articles. Um, leather really is a very, very unusual uh, material. And those consumers that are going to be making these choices have changed, and we've seen that change quite dramatically through the pandemic. The economic center of gravity, which I alluded to, has shifted east. It's been going there for the last 30 years or more, but it's been quite distinct now. And consumer culture evolves with it. And the younger generations are now the major consumers. The under 40s are now our biggest consumers. And in fact, in the West, the elderly are quite likely to be much more constrained in terms of getting out and they're the ones that have been hit most badly by the um, pandemic and even with vaccinations I and it's anticipated it's not a hundred percent certain it's anticipated that in the main they will be careful and slow about picking up uh, the expenditure on which many uh, companies had come to depend with so many parts of the world, such as Europe, uh, uh, effectively aging societies. So a lot of people have been pushed into unemployment and poverty, but on the other hand, uh, very large numbers have ended up with big savings, and there's a feeling that there is a, 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 an urge to get out and to spend. And we have to be careful that some sudden surges of spend, we don't turn into a belief that this is a big new long-term trend. Uh, some of them might be quite short-term. We've got to be careful in how we look at that. As I'd already alluded to, uh, some of the stronger economies, we expect a very fast rebound US is talking about um, um, six to eight uh, percent rise um, this this year. China's talking about um, even higher figures. And of course, with that comes a danger of in inflation. And it does mean that there are very likely going to be a lot of completely new areas for leather or old niches, which are offering a, a, a birth in significant, um, in significant growth. If we look at fashion, just as a, an example, all the fashion shows moved online and a lot was learned from that. Um, whether they'll come fully back, um, um, 
who knows, big, big money was saved. Um, it'll probably, like so many other areas, uh, end up with this new word, hybrid. Everything's becoming hybrid. Um, um, our clothing and footwear has become much more casual for work and everyday, everyday wear. And of course, because so many are working at home, uh, the two have started to merge. Questions being asked whether neckties and stiletto shoes um, will survive as working clothes um, outside of people like bankers and, and uh, politicians. And even with our politicians, we are uh, seeing them beginning to dress down um, to feel and look more like the people that they um, serve. So for every day and for work, we're seeing more soft clothing, more curvy clothing. Um, it's moving into something a little bit better than pure lounge wear uh, and sneakers. And so it's becoming more of a new smart casual. Uh, perhaps the cardigan is back. Um, um, uh, suits that are, are more uh, like a jacket and slacks and things of that sort. Um, uh, touch and softness is very important. For ladies, one of our uh, top magazine um, editors in style is talking about uh, uh, much less makeup, much more leather uh, coming back, draping leather, butter soft leather, uh, Napa suede, um, very natural, not painted like plastic. <laughs> There's a talk of a return to the roaring 20s. Uh, make of that what you like. There certainly will be some sectors that will want to get their wardrobes out again, get overdressed and get out to party and to have events uh, dressed up. But of course, like the roaring 20s, they lasted for a, uh, a decade. Um, this is not going to last a decade. But we will see um, some element of uh, bounce back um, in terms of people who have been constrained indoors for so long wanting to get back out. Um, luxury has lacked the opportunity for travel and for tourism and all the experiences that come um, with that. And although they've had quite a good first quarter in some markets such as uh, as China and a little bit, I think, the United States uh, this year. In general, um, leather goods have moved um, towards uh, uh, classic items. <coughs> Things like private jets have done well, and interior design in leather has become quite a big new area. Sustainability top of, is uh, top of mind with all the brands, of course, and is very much the subject of this these week's talks. But I think in terms of the brands, delivery and actual material knowledge is quite patchy, but it is an area of huge conversation and importance. And that creates challenges for leather. We've got the rising raw material prices, opening the door for alternates, which I've mentioned. But in the sustainability area, there's big money attacking livestock and leather now huge money, um, and it's coming at um, great strength in the pre-COP26 talks this, no, this no November. The leather industry responses have been rather too few, too disunited, and that's a worry given the wealth of opposing groups. Uh, and the leather industry, uh, for this reason and others, is going to have to increase its marketing. And that marketing's got to include more work on understanding uh, consumers. For the marketeers amongst you, um, you'll know about the waggle bee um, and that um, the, we have about 80% of waggle bees and 20% of explorers. Well, we need more investment in the explorer to understand the changing consumers right now, um, uh, more <clears throat> looking at the context. Associated with that comes much more innovation 
to meet these new new needs uh, and uh, emotional requirements of consumers in product, in the communication about that, and in the way in which we deliver. So it's a real product and service innovation. We need to support industry campaigns better, and we need to take much more care with our language to be accurate and to avoid greenwash. We can look back at one or two successes. Uh, in 2020, although the consumption of shoes went down, uh, quite a few of us working at home decided not to wear shoes at all uh, around the house. But things like Crocs and Birkenstocks did particularly well. And house shoes or slippers did reasonably well in 2020. Um, in 2021, there's a thought that clogs are going to be uh, a, big, a big hit. I mentioned how well classic luxury handbags have come through. The Chinese domestic consumption has grown very strongly, uh, so much so that China has this dual policy of still trying to service exports, but trying to put large amounts of products um, into uh, the domestic market, uh, which is growing, and things like the automobile industry and others, luxury goods industry, um, you can see that this is proving um, very successful and very influential um, in, the, in the world right now. Electric automobiles have grown much faster than had been expected. Uh, sectors in sports like golf and outdoor walking have been uh, uh, of huge importance. Golf a surprise because it's been in the doldrums for uh, just over 20 years. The sudden growth and entry of young people has been unusual. The world of sneakers has somewhat exploded, uh, including special editions and classic models. Um, and with that, this emphasis that we've seen from Nike of direct to consumer uh, uh, sales, where they take into account what I've been saying about getting to know consumers uh, better, and they've been talking directly to them uh, for, well, uh, many, many years, much before the pandemic. And so I've been in a good position to make this adjustment and be close to, to their final consumers all during the pandemic and have benefited uh, from that. And there's generally speaking, a stronger belief in science um, and the environment um, and climate and biodiversity. And that emphasizes the need to uh, rewrite the story of leather and get new words uh, to go just beyond saying, oh, we are sustainable. We've got to start thinking in, in, in new areas, biophilic, renewable, eternal, essential uh, uh, about leather. Talk about it in entirely uh, different ways. We think, look in an airplane, uh, the durability with very, very heavy use, leather will last eight to 10 years plus. It'll have very, very low cost maintenance, a damp cloth in the main. And throughout that time, it will always look luxurious. And on a pair of shoes, something as simple as a pair of shoes, if we can keep them in use another year, we save the planet digging in to other, for other new resources and spending money on energy, transportation, distribution. You should alternate your pairs. You should allow them to dry slowly when they get wet. You should polish them regularly. You should replace the sole on those shoes that you can. And you should keep them for many years and enjoy them and let them grow and develop with you. And in doing that, you'll enjoy your leather more and you will save your planet. And you can only do it with leather as it's the only material that offers you that longevity. So leather is unique in its ability to combine beauty, comfort, 
practicality. It connects with consumers in very complex ways. It has the capacity for us as tanneries to help it to keep redefining itself to be conventional and relevant. And it's the best material for the post-pandemic world. And I hope that that's given you some feeling and some material with which to consider how you see your world of leather adapting and how to make meaning uh, of it. Um, and my emails at the bottom are through Chloe and APLF, uh, ask me any questions. If they're specifically about Leather Naturally, which has wonderful fact sheets on its website about uh, leather, please send that directly uh, to the Leather Act, uh, uh, Naturally uh, organization. Thank you very much.